President-elect Donald Trump's proposal to cap credit card interest rates at 10 percent has drawn support from progressives like Senator Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, but some experts warn that that cap could come with a big catch, potentially making it much harder for consumers to qualify for credit cards or access lines of credit. Joining us right now is Natasha Sarin. She's a Yale University professor who's also a former Treasury Department official. Also, Michael Strain is AI, AEI Director of Economic Policy Studies. Um, Michael, let's just start with you because you don't like this policy at all. I don't like this policy at all. I think you've got a situation where Bernie Sanders is for something, the progressive left is for something, and the kind of populist nationalist right is for it. And typically when those two groups are agreeing, uh, the policy is bad. This is a policy that is effectively a price control. This is a policy that would lead credit card lenders not to extend credit to people with relatively low credit scores. You know, people who are kind of just getting started in their careers or people who, uh, uh, for whatever reason, have a, low, have a low score. Those are often people who really need credit. The only way it makes sense to lend to them is to charge them a high rate of interest because their default risk is higher. And so this is a kind of classic example of a policy with, you know, that, that, that's designed with really good intentions, but that would end up hurting the very people that it's designed to help. Natasha, can you speak to that? I mean, this, this is a situation. You don't want usury rates for credit cards, uh, but you also want to make sure that people who are just starting out aren't going to be told there's no room for you because you, know, you don't have a credit score, you don't have a credit history that we can trust or make these decisions based on. And, you know, interestingly, this is an area where I agree a fair bit with Michael because mm -hmm. it's a situation where you understand, like, the political attractiveness of a proposal like this. Sure. You have Americans paying. It's a high-interest rate environment. Americans are paying $100 billion a year in interest on credit card lending. But when you have such a proposal, you really kind of have to evaluate it, not just for its intended consequences, but also for its unintended consequences. And Michael's right. What's going to happen is certain types of consumers, particularly new borrowers who are subprime, who don't have a credit history, yeah. are going to be priced out of the market in a situation where banks and lenders aren't able to charge them a higher rate of interest. And what's going to happen when they get priced out of the market What's going to happen is they're going to turn to even more expensive alternatives. So you have credit card interest rates that average 20% today. Yeah. Payday lender interest rates are 400%. Okay, that's a really good point. I, I, th this is a simplistic policy that ignores a lot of things, not just from the perspective that it doesn't get outside of the credit card industry. But, Michael, what about the idea that we're just going to say 10%? Okay, maybe that's one thing when the 10 years sitting at 4% and change. What happens if rates were to go up to 8, 9, 10%? That would price a lot of people out of the market. It would. And, and, and again, it's a good example of why it's difficult for the government to kind of reach into markets and micromanage what's happening with businesses. You, uh, you know, 10% is a a rate that sounds high in a zero interest rate environment, but we are no longer in a zero interest rate environment. And there are a whole lot of reasons to believe that yields are going to rise even higher relative to where they are today. And that makes 10 percent, you know, look, look more and more restrictive. But I do want to say that this, like, I don't want to sort of agree with Michael fully in that this Credit card markets and payments markets in general are an area where regulatory intervention, I think, can be successful. I was going to say, what's the right way to do this? If this is not the right way, what, what would you recommend, Natasha? So there kind of are two component parts. One is that credit card contracts used to be a page long and, like, readable to you and me. I teach corporate finance, and credit card contracts today are 38 pages long and indecipherable to people who don't have a college degree. Some people would say that's because of Sarbanes-Oxley and other things that have been insisted by Congress and, and, and legislated by Congress along the way. I think they're sort of thinking about regulation and thinking about the ways to accurately design regulation is super important. But understanding that what's happened is these markets have become more complex is these card, con card companies are able to attach contract terms that no one reads that raise the price of credit for consumers. And the result is not just that the price of credit is high, it's also that we don't actually know what we're paying for credit. And so I think a really important aspect here is disclosure. A really important aspect here is thinking seriously about the ways in which we can try to get at some of those hidden terms. Disclosure sounds like the contracts are going to get even longer. Yeah, I hear, <laughs> I totally, disclosure, simplicity, I totally agree with you. 
And Disclosure and simplicity are often two different things. And there's another aspect of this, by the way, that sort of you might not think about that much, but I really think in payments markets is super important for us to unpack. When you and I go to the grocery store and pay with our rewards credit cards, we get a kickback essentially in the form of rewards points or airline miles. And when sort of poor people who disproportionately pay in cash, maybe because they don't have access to credit cards, they don't get access to any of those same type of rewards. I don't know how you fix that. Michael, do you agree with Natasha on this point? Uh, no, I don't agree with Natasha on this. I, I think that the grocery stores and, and, and retail stores should be free to give those kickbacks to people they want. And if paying with a credit card is more valuable to a grocery store or a retail store than paying in cash or paying with a check, the grocery store should be able to, to, to engage in that transaction the way that they see fit. Trying to, trying to micromanage that type of payment structure Natasha, it is exactly like you... uh, the type of oh, problem. Ahead. It sounds like you were saying something more like airline rewards programs. But Correct. What, what, what does that mean? So they have to, to let be, everybody into the program? Just to be clear, no, 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 not at all. Just or to nobody be clear, Michael, the, program. the credit card companies are paying, uh, are charging a 5% interchange rate on these transactions. That means that when you go to the grocery store, the grocer has to pay 5% for your inquiry, you're using your rewards credit card. When someone pays in cash, the grocery store doesn't have to pay anything. But because of the way that card companies have designed these contracts, it is impossible for the grocery store to pass on that 5% just to those consumers who are paying with their rewards credit cards. So the result is higher prices for everyone and rewards just for those at the very top of the distribution. And I don't think that's a fair system. I don't think that's an equitable system. So nobody should be allowed to offer those rewards to customers who they really want as, on as customers? If you compare us, no. People should be able to offer rewards to customers. But if you compare us to countries like Europe and Australia, they don't have those type of regressive subsidies in their system. And the reason they don't is because they have designed regulations. It's not, it's not a that subsidy that comes from a taxpayer. That's a subsidy. If this is a company that wants to subsidize uh, who they think is going to be a valuable customer, that's a different thing. No, but, I, but what happens in those countries is that the cost of transacting on those credit cards is borne by the consumers who are paying with those credit cards. That's not what happens in the U.S. today. The cost of transacting with those cards is borne by everyone. And so I do think there's a way to better target those costs and those benefits so they hit exactly the consumers who they should, rather than being borne by people who are paying with cash who today have an inequitable system because they don't get any access to any of those rewards. They just pay higher prices.